Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by our store, where you can get all sorts of dinosaur merchandise featuring different dinosaurs. One of them is our logo. And all that stuff is at bit.ly slash I Know Dino store. And there's a link in the show notes too. This week in our 270th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a new Alvarez Saurid and a new Microraptorine. So a lot of new small dinosaurs, but still ferocious. <laughs> and a ton of museum news. And we also have Dinosaur of the Day, Struthiomimus, as well as our fun fact, which is about Alvarosaurs. Spoiler alert. <laughs> But before we get into all of that, we always like to thank our patrons, the driving force behind I Know Dino, without whom we could not make the podcast. So we really appreciate you all. And this week, we'd like to thank Scotty, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklove, Risa, Kelly, Manda, Laurasaurus, Timmy, James Pasco, Gabe, TRX Dinosaurs, and Michael. Yeah, thank you so much, as Garrett mentioned. This group is the reason we can keep doing the podcast, so we really appreciate it. And we are coming up with new ways to make our community on Patreon more exciting, so stay tuned. Yeah, we're working on our annual survey now where we'll ask for feedback on what other potential things people might be interested in seeing from us. And yes, the survey's late, but better late than never. <laughs> <laughs> it's not late. We're going to put it out exactly when we intend to. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to join this growing community, though, of dinosaur enthusiasts, then go to our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. So again, that's patreon.com slash I know dino, I-K-N-O-W-D-I-N-O. Yeah, that's where you get all the good stuff. The good stuff that's not available just through the regular podcast. And jumping into the news, we have our first new dinosaur. This is an Alvarezsaurid. It was published in Scientific Reports by Sung Jin Lee and others. And in it, they describe actually several Alvarezsaurid specimens. A quick reminder, Alvarezsaurids are those approximately chicken-sized dinosaurs with basically a single claw on each wing, but really it's more of like just a stumpy claw. <laughs> yeah, that might have looked funny. Yes, it looked very funny, especially in the paleo art. You can see how ridiculous it looks. The more I look at them, though, I start to think that they look more like roadrunners because they have pretty long legs and they're kind of gangly. And then they have basically no wings, just like how roadrunners have pretty small arms, too. So that might be an easier way to think of them than thinking of a chicken. But either way, Alvarez hordes are mostly from South America and Asia. And this one is no exception. It's from Mongolia. It was actually found in the 2008 Korea-Mongolia International Dinosaur Expedition, and during that expedition, they found a small bone bed, which is, quote-unquote, less than half a meter square, which makes it about five square feet. So yes, it is very small. <laughs> but in that small area, there was a ton of dinosaur material to go through. Last year, they named Gobi Raptor from that collection of bones. There was also quote, at least two other larger undescribed, end quote, oviraptorids found in that five square foot area. I'm sure they'll be describing it later. Yes. And then there are three alvarosaurids for a total of at least six theropods <laughs> just in that little five square foot area. wonder what brought them all together. Probably dying would be my guess. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> like they got buried together for one reason or another. But yeah, it's a good question. Were they alive together doing something like communally behaving with at least three different species? That'd be super weird. But stranger things have happened for sure. This paper in particular is all about the three new Alvarezsaurid specimens. One of the Alvarezsaurids was assigned to Mononychus, which you're probably familiar with. It's one of the best known, if not the best known Alvarezsaurid. It was the first one described with a good arm on it, which is why it has a name Mononychus for one claw. And in this case, they mostly just found an articulated leg and foot of the Mononychus, so they don't have any of the awesome claw. And in fact, none of the Alvarezsaurids that they found had any claws or arms, which is kind of a bummer because that's the coolest part of the Alvarezsaurids. But the other two Alvarezsaurid specimens are a new dinosaur that they named, and they named it Nemectonychus cetus. And Nemectonychus comes from Nemect for the Nemect formation, where it was found in Mongolia, plus Onyx 
for claw in Greek, although it's spelled a little bit differently, and that goes back to a beetle that had the same names. Dinosaurs are always getting renamed <laughs> because they're accidentally getting named the same thing as a beetle. So Mononychus is the same, and then Nemectonychus just keeps the same well, kind of weird spelling. It's not always beetles, but yeah. Yeah. It is often insects. It is. There are too many of those things. So you can think of it as either Nemectonyx, as in Nemectin claw, or you could think of it as just Nemectin alvarosaurid, because a lot of times they end in Nycus. And then the species name Cetus means swift in Latin, so it's like the swift Nemect alvarosaurid. Since there are two individuals in the find, they had to name one as the holotype and one as the paratype, which isn't officially the dinosaur that you would compare future finds to, but it is one that they believe is the, of the same species and genus. For the holotype, they found tons of vertebrae, a shoulder blade, some ribs, hips, leg and foot bones, but unfortunately there weren't any arm bones, like I said before, and there also wasn't a skull. There wasn't a skull for any of the alvarosaurids either, so a little bit of a bummer because those can be so interesting and unique. Same with the arm bones for alvarosaurids. Yeah, yeah. So we have enough to know that it's probably a unique genus and species, but not enough to really nail down what it looked like and maybe how it compared to some of the other alvarosaurids. For the paratype, pretty much all the bones are from the legs and feet. Interestingly, though, it's a different color than the holotype, <laughs> so it was easier for them to match up which one came to, from which individual because... I guess all of the paratype bones were a little bit lighter or something. They kind of looked like the same color and a different color than the other bones. Especially weird since it was found in such a small area. In terms of appearance, Nemectonychus is very similar to Mononychus, the original Mongolian alvarosaurid. <laughs> By looking at the description, about half of the distinctions between Mononychus and Nemectonychus are from bones in the hips and feet that are fused in Nemectonychus, but not in Mononychus. And that's often linked to age, sometimes injury. But there were two of them, which helps because that means that they probably weren't individual variation because both the paratype and the holotype had some of these similarities. Plus, we already know that it's a multi-taxa deposit because of Gobi Raptor, which was found mixed in with these two. So it's not that surprising that there would be a Mononychus and a Nemectonychus with each other. And then on top of that, the Nemectonychus is slightly smaller at about 3.4 kilograms or 7.5 pounds compared with what they thought Mononychus was. So if it's smaller, but it has some features you might expect to see in an adult, that makes you think that, yeah, it could be its own genus for sure. And there were a couple other features that were unique, like a little ridge on one of the vertebrae that you don't see on Mononychus. So in the end, we ended up with a second alvarosaurid from the Nemect formation. Previously, they had thought that the Nemect formation didn't have very many alvarosaurids, and they were kind of restricted to other formations within Mongolia, because there are, there are other formations within Mongolia, and that's where a lot of the other alvarosaurids have come from. So now we know that they weren't just in other parts, they were also at least two in the Nemect formation. We'll probably find more soon, too. Hopefully next time we find some claws, though, or at least a skull. Or preferably a claw doing something that lets us know what they use those claws yeah. for. Embedded in like a termite mound or something. Mm -hmm. It'd be good to have a copper light, too, so we could see what they were eating. Maybe some gut contents, you know, small things. <laughs> there was one that was found where it was in good enough preservation that we could see feathers on that Shavuya. So maybe... Mm -hmm. At some point, you know, if you can find feathers preserved, you could find gut contents. Yeah. It's not too much to ask. <laughs> Up next is our new Microraptorine. This one was published in the Anatomical Record by Ashley Paust and others. Being a Microraptorine from Northeast China, you probably have a vague idea of what it looks like because they're all pretty much amazingly preserved. <laughs> and they have that sort of Archaeopteryx look to them where they're squished down and you can see a lot of details. This one is just like those. It's no exception. It's from the early Cretaceous, about 120 million years ago. Its full name is Wulong Bohiensis, and Wulong means dancing dragon. It's because of, quote, its sprightly pose and inferred nimble habits. Oh, that's fun. Quote. <laughs> yeah. I like, too, that they didn't name it just after the place where it was from, because that's a popular thing to do in China. It's like the fairies of dinosaurs. <laughs> that it's sprightly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Then the Bohiensis is after the Bohai Strait, which isn't where the dinosaur was found. It's where the museum that it's housed in is. So they named it after the location near the museum. And I think that might be partly because they're not sure where it came from, because this one wasn't dug up by researchers. They talk about how it was dug up by an amateur that was skilled, but not well aware of dinosaur anatomy because they ended up sort of preparing it a little bit and trying to glue some things back together that were slightly out of place. Uh, So then you lose a little bit of data. Yeah. And I I don't think they know where exactly it came from. They didn't say in the paper. So I'm guessing they just don't know. They also didn't say who they bought it from. So (laughs) it might be a secret. Being a microraptorine, it's also a dromaeosaur. That's a larger group or a raptor. So it has those claws on its feet. And just like microraptor, it seems to have had four feathered limbs, meaning it's got the feathered arms and legs. The tail didn't seem to be quite as feathered, although it was also feathered. As is common for dinosaurs in the area, the whole animal is articulated in essentially a single slab of rock. It's sort of been glued back together a little bit, but in general, you can look at it in one piece and see its whole proportions and everything. It's really cool. It's also bigger than I expected it to be. When I blew it up to scale on my computer, I was like, is that right? I had to check like three or four times because the body alone, excluding the tail, is about a foot long, which is pretty big for one of these finds that fits in a single block. And Wulong's full length, including the tail and the tail feathers, would have been about three feet long. So it's a pretty long animal. Yeah. Yeah especially to find in one piece. Even though it's found in one slab, unfortunately, it is a little bit crushed. The skull especially is crushed because that tends to happen when it kind of gets smashed down into this one plane. The neck vertebrae are also crushed, but the rest of it is in a lot better shape. It's a little bit less crushed once you get farther into the body. This super good preservation is due to how it was deposited in the fine lake sediment that's common for these fossils. And it's only missing a few little bones, basically a couple ribs and a couple finger bones. Looks like all that's missing out of the entire skeleton. So like I said, without its tail, it's about a foot long. And then the tail adds another two feet. (laughs) (laughs) But the feathers at the end of the tail alone account for about six inches of that tail length. Wow. Yeah, they're really cool feathers. They look like the resplendent quetzal. And I was thinking that. And then once you get to the very end in the conclusion, they mention that bird. And <laughs> I was like, oh, good. I'm not way off on this one. So it's a pretty famous bird. The reason I know of it is because it shares a name with the quetzal coatalus, that big pterosaur. And the resplendent quetzal, it has a green body and it has these two really long green tails. You might have seen it in one of those bird documentaries. They hang way off its back and off its tail. Obviously, birds don't really have tails the same way dinosaurs do. They just have a little stump like we have for our tailbone. And then they, they're they mostly feathers. This one had both. <laughs> Wulong had a long foot and a half long tail and then another, another half a foot of feathers sticking off the end of that. So it's almost like one of those ribbon dancers in the Olympics or something. Yeah, it was made for dancing. Exactly. Yeah, it's really cool. Its wingspan is not very impressive (laughs) compared to the length of its body. It's only about one and a half feet. Oh, that's hard to beat. Yeah, I think they said 42 centimeters. And there were also really narrow wings. They had, I think they call it a high aspect ratio or something, sort of like a widescreen computer situation where it's kind of skinny and long but not all that long because it's only one and a half foot wingspan. So I don't know how good of a flyer it really would have been. And there's been questions about whether these dinosaurs that had feathers on their legs really would have been all that good at flying anyway, because they might have just created extra drag. Plus, it's got the big feathers on its tail. It's kind of all over the place. The first thing that made me think I was measuring this dinosaur wrong was by looking at its head because its skull is longer than its femur. What? (laughs) Yeah. And it's several inches long and full of sharp serrated teeth. So it has a lot more head on it than what you expect to see in one of these little birdish dinosaurs. Big head, a decent wingspan, and giant tail. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty strange proportioned animal. They didn't give a weight estimate of Wulong, but I'd say it was probably just a couple of pounds. This group is often compared to crows, and that's probably the right ballpark for sort of estimating its weight. But then obviously crows aren't three feet long because they don't have a long skinny tail sticking out the back of them. So it's and crows also have a wider wingspan, so it's still not a great 
description. This one also would have had longer legs than a crow, but they probably would have been similar colors because we have microraptors with preserved melanosome-like structures, and based on that, we think they were that same iridescent black color as a crow, and since this is a close relative, that's still our best guess at what color it would have been. And that's the color they pick for the pale yard, too. They suspected that it was a juvenile based on the fact that its bones weren't fully fused, and fortunately, the museum where it's stored allowed them to slice open the bones to confirm that, which (laughs) is not always easy to do when you find a holotype to just start cutting it open. And they cut open a bunch of bones. (laughs) It wasn't just one bone. I think they cut open three or four of them to compare. And I, I think part of it, too, is they were looking for lags, those lines of arrested growth like tree rings but they didn't find them. So I'm wondering if maybe they looked in one bone and didn't find it. And then were like, well, maybe that other bone might have one and didn't find one there either. And then after a few times, they thought maybe we should stop. Yes. <laughs> By the time they got to the fibula, they found that it might have one. They could have started with the fibula too. I made up that story, but <laughs> there might be one lag in the fibula. So maybe it was one year old, like just over one year old. They said it was probably nearly one year old, though, because that was the only bone that had a lag in it. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe it grew into its body. It would have less weird proportions as an adult. Yeah, that's true. So maybe it got like longer arms later or something. Yeah, it grew into the tail. basically. (laughs) Yeah. When they did their histology, too, they also got a chance to look at the bone microstructure. And that also looked like it was still growing. So, yeah, to your point, maybe it was still growing and changing proportions a little bit. One fun thing is there were these whitish inch-long objects in the slab with Wulong. And Sabrina, I'm going to have you guess what they are. So they appear to contain some bone. They're straight rather than coiled, which suggests that it's a tetrapod. Hmm. Those are the two hints. Straight rather than coiled. Uh-huh. Whitish. Mm-hmm. Contain some bone. Contain some bone. And it's some sort of animal? It is not an animal. Oh, with some bone. Hmm. Garrett's smiling all expectantly. (laughs) I don't know. What could it be? Is it it, it a plant? It's a coprolite. Oh, oh, I should have guessed that. (laughs) Yeah, but they didn't know which animal it came from. They can't tell if it came from Wulong or not. They didn't really explore it in the paper. Ooh, with some bone. Yeah, I thought it was funny that the fact that if if it was coiled meant that it wouldn't have been from a tetrapod, (laughs) like a poop emoji. Right. I was thinking, oh, it's not coiled. It can't be poop. (laughs) (laughs) But of course it can. Anyway. Yeah. So we'll have to wait for a future paper to find out what is all going on with this coprolite. But back to Wulong, they, I've already hinted at it several times, found several feathers all over the dinosaur, really more than several. It's basically like the whole dinosaur is covered in feathers. There were filamentous or hair-like feathers around the head and hips primarily, and then in some of the other areas where you wouldn't need flight feathers. And then the wings have long and possibly asymmetric flight feathers, so we might be seeing the ability to fly a little bit at least. Enough to kind of glide or hop along, help with the dancing. Yeah, (laughs) there you go. Like those extended leaps to be impressive. And then, of course, it has those amazing half a foot long feathers sticking off the back of its tail. But the interesting thing about that is we know it was a juvenile and the resplendent quetzals and other similar birds that have these big feathers for display don't grow those display feathers until they're quite a bit older and sexually mature. And we know that this dinosaur wasn't sexually mature yet because it it was still very young. So maybe the feathers weren't related to mating is the main hypothesis that they have. Otherwise, maybe they just grew them early and they there wasn't a big selective pressure. Like maybe it's just easy to have them hanging off the back and they don't affect Wulong the same way that they affect something like a resplendent quetzal that's trying to fly around and having these feathers in the way. So who knows? Or evolution's just trying something new. Yeah. (laughs) They looked at a few other microraptorines And a lot of them don't have ages associated with them. Like I said, for these ones that are in a slab, it's kind of hard to do histology on them. And even when they do histology, it's not always easy to tell the exact age. So we're not really sure exactly when these feathers started growing on these dinosaurs. 
One piece that you don't see in most papers is a big section on the provenance (laughs) of the dinosaur, but since they got it from a potentially suspicious origin, a large portion of the paper is dedicated to whether or not the fossil itself is fake, including x-ray images of the dinosaur and lots of detail as also some uv images all sorts of stuff where they're comparing little details trying to see if part of the slab that looks like it was just glued back together might have come from a different source and been glued in there to make it look like a more complete and valuable specimen and it shouldn't be too big of a surprise either because some of the micro raptors from china specifically have run into issues with not being entirely real But after all their analysis, they think that it was 100% valid, and they think the only weird thing about it was that foot that has some toes glued on (laughs) in the wrong place. But they're guessing that that's probably because when they open the slab and you have sort of two sides to your lithograph plate and most of the dinosaur is stuck in the one, and that's the one we're looking at, maybe some of the toe bones were on the other half. When they broke it open and then they just removed them from the other half of the slab and glued them onto this side, but just didn't glue them on quite right. That's their best guess at how it ended up this way. So, in the end, we're left with our brand new Microraptorine Wulong. And if you want to see it, it might be on display. I don't know, but it's at the Dalian Natural History Museum in Dalian, China which keeps coming up more and more often in the news. So they probably have quite the collection growing at this point. We say that a lot about museums in China. Yes. In the U.S., though, Washington State might soon have an official dinosaur. This is an interesting one. It's a theropod nicknamed Suchiosaurus rex. So it's not the official name of the dinosaur. Hmm. And Suchiosaurus was found in 2012 by two researchers from the Burke Museum. They found the left femur of a theropod, And this is the only dinosaur that's ever been found in Washington. It lived about 88 million years ago in a coastal area, and it got its nickname from Sukia Island, where it was found. And then they added Rex to the name when it was on a t-shirt for the museum. So it's actually an, quote, indeterminate theropod dinosaur, end quote. (sighs) But it's got a nickname, so. It still needs to be voted on, as of this recording at least, but the reason it's getting attention now is because of some fourth graders at Elmhurst Elementary. So the bill was introduced in March of 2019, last year, and then there was no progress on it. So these fourth graders pushed ahead, and actually sponsor representative Melanie Morgan said that she was reintroducing the bill, quote, on behalf of some civically engaged, and quote, fourth graders. So good for them. Yeah. Oh, you don't like it because it doesn't have an official name yet? I mean, they're calling it Suchiosaurus, but that makes it sound like it's an actual genus, and it's just not. It could be eventually. It's kind of like if we lived in Vermont and I was like, let's make the Vermont state dinosaur Garrettosaurus. No, it'd be more like, let's make the Vermont dinosaur Montpeliosaurus or something, or somewhere where it was found. (laughs) Yeah, I don't like it. Okay, well, don't talk to those fourth graders, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) that could be why progress has stalled i don't know i don't know the details it could be i would wait until they find a real dinosaur that can be named which could be really difficult i know it's difficult in oregon to find anything yeah but once you name the dinosaur the state dinosaur i feel like it's going to be hard to change and if it's named the suchiosaurus thing which is really just a nickname and then they find a cool dinosaur then they're going to be stuck with it Maybe. Or Washington gets its official dinosaur. Eventually, Suchiosaurus gets an official description and has the name Suchiosaurus, and then it's all good. Well, it could happen, yeah, that's true. Better than the nickname, like, Bob Rex or something like that. <laughs> I suppose. Like, this one sounds like a real name. It does. But that's partly why I don't like it, because I think it's misleading. Hmm. Well, moving on to museum news... So the Fukui Prefectural Dinosaur Museum in Japan will be spending 86 million U.S. dollars on renovations, and that's going to be completed by 2023. They have plans to have larger exhibition spaces and a new area for interactive fossil excavation and replica making lessons. Wow. And they want to boost their visitor numbers by 50 percent. The renovations will be done right after a new bullet train starts running to Fukui. So oh, wow. be much easier to get there. And apparently there's currently 41,000 items in a 15,000 square meter floor space, 
which doesn't surprise me. It didn't seem that crowded when we were there, though. I mean, 15,000 square meters is huge. It does seem because remember, we went through and we took pictures of everything Mm -hmm. and it took hours because you literally just move an inch and you got to take a new picture. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there was a lot in there, but it was organized in such a way that you didn't have to walk that far to see so much. Like there's just a ton of stuff in there. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. But the bullet train is pretty huge because when Sabrina and I went there, it was you took a bullet train for two or three hours. Then we had to get on a different train for an hour or two. And then once you get to Fukui, you're still like an hour away from the museum. By tram. Yeah, basically a a really slow tram. A really pretty ride, but... Yeah, it was great. I actually really enjoyed that part of it. But it isn't quick. I'm surprised that their visitor numbers aren't as high as they would like, though, because it's such an amazing museum that you'd think it would just be everybody who's remotely interested in dinosaurs would go there. Well, if it's too difficult to get there... It took us a fair amount of planning. Yeah, it's basically a weekend trip, not a day trip. Mm-hmm. With the bullet train, maybe they could turn it into a day trip from Tokyo or something. That would make it easier to have more school visits. Yeah, that's true. Next, the Paleontological Society has named Archaeopteryx as its Fossil of the Year for 2020, which I didn't know this award existed, but <laughs> apparently it was established in 2008, the award, and they chose Archaeopteryx this year because of its important evidence for evolution. So it's only been going since 2008. This is like the 12th or 13th dinosaur of the year. Fossil of the year. So it doesn't necessarily have to be dinosaurs. Gotcha. At first, when you said that, I thought the fossil of 2020, because (laughs) Archaeopteryx is like 140 years old in terms of its discovery. But I suppose they're just going through the greatest hits at this point. Yeah, they've got some catching up to do. It's definitely an important fossil. Oh, yeah. There's another important fossil or set of fossils is Tristan Otto the T-Rex, which is an original skeleton that's moving at the end of this month, January, from the Natural History Museum in Berlin to the Natural History Museum in Copenhagen. Tristan's been on loan to Berlin for the last four years, and we've talked about it. They've done a lot of public research. But apparently Tristan will go back to Berlin in 2021, so I'm not really sure of the story there. But yeah. anyway, Tristan Otto is named after Niels Nielsen's two sons. And Niels and a friend acquired the T-Rex. And then they were the ones who decided that it should be publicly displayed and researched, which is very good. Tristan originally came from Montana. And then the team in Berlin constructed the skeleton in about a month in 2015. But the head's 3D printed because it was way too heavy to mount. You see that a lot with T-Rex specimens. Because they're what, like three or four feet long, one or two feet tall, solid rock, fragile, Mm -hmm. glued together in a lot of cases. It's pretty precarious. Yeah. I think the skull is next to the body, though. Yeah, they do that a lot. That's a good move. It's interesting it's going back because I think previously when we've reported on this, we've heard that it was going to move from Berlin to Copenhagen and then Copenhagen was going to be its permanent place yeah. forever because they're making it like a permanent home for it. But I guess permanent home with some little excursions out and about now and then, and then it'll come back to Copenhagen. Yeah, could be. Or just back and forth between Berlin and Copenhagen. Hmm. I don't know. In New Mexico in the U.S., the Las Cruces Museum of Art has a new exhibit, Dinosaur Discoveries Ancient Fossils New Ideas, and that's going to show how we've changed our thinking about dinosaur biology over the last 20 years, which has changed a lot. Oh, yeah. And it also shows current research from scientists from the American Museum of Natural History, as well as research from other paleontologists. The exhibit has computer simulations, fossils, and models, And they're all part of four themes. So the themes are how dinosaurs moved, the Liaoning Forest, they have the diorama of part of a 130 million year old forest in China, how dinosaurs behaved, and extinction. Which is pretty cool if you think about all this paleontology, natural history stuff going to be on display in an art museum. Yeah, that's fun. The National Museum of Scotland has a new exhibition from now until May 4th that's all about tyrannosaurs. It's a traveling exhibit that was made by the Australian Museum and toured by Flying Fish. And this is the only time apparently it'll be in Europe. So if you're nearby, you should check it out. They have fossils, casts, including of Scotty the T-Rex, and models of Guanlong and other feathered dinosaurs. And there's a pretty fun video trailer that shows Guanlong getting from the airport to the museum to be part of the exhibit. And Guanlong takes a train and runs up some stairs, kind of pushes past some people, though they don't seem too 
Terrified? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that must be the exhibit, the Tyrannosaur family one that Mel made that we talked about with her at the Australian Museum. Oh, yeah. Or at least that she contributed to. Yeah, that sounds right. It's all coming together. <laughs> In Kansas in the U.S., the Sternberg Museum of Natural History has a new exhibit called Prairie Ocean, Long Time No Sea, S-E-A, which isn't really about dinosaurs, but that name was too good not to share. (laughs) (laughs) And there's art and fossils of marine animals. No sea. Yeah. That could be a decent name for a dinosaur exhibit because they didn't live in the sea. Oh, that too. Long Time No Sea. And also we haven't seen them in a long time. Yeah. Yeah, It's great. (laughs) For paleo artists, Mark Winton's teaching a new paleo art short course in March, March 4th to 6th, called Recreating Prehistoric Animals in Art. And he's teaching in association with the University of Portsmouth. There's going to be six lectures, a seminar, and five practical sessions. And the course syllabus is on his site. It says that they're going to be talking about the history of paleo art, case studies, and animal anatomy, among many other things. The course is going to work with modern and fossil specimens. So for anyone interested, you can book now. And we'll have a link in our show notes. That sounded like an ad, but it wasn't. It's just something that's cool. That's true. Yeah. Paleo art courses are cool. And we like Mark. (laughs) Last, the TV show Dinosaurs is getting Funko Pops. One for each character in the Sinclair family. Uh. Earl, Fran, Robbie, Charlene, and the baby. It sounds like there's going to be Funko Pops of other older TV shows coming out soon, too. But this one looks pretty good. Yeah, that does sound good. I really want a baby one. I haven't even seen it, but I know I want it. (laughs) You just say, not the mom all the time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But if you can't wait to get those Funko Pops and you want some dinosaur merchandise, you can get it from our store. We don't have any figurines, but we do have t-shirts and Lots of clothes, as well as like phone cases and notebooks, other stuff that you can use. Yep. This is a real ad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> our stuff features either our logo or an Allosaurus or a Gorgosaurus or a Parasaurolophus. So they're not all carnivores, just mostly carnivores because our logo has a T-Rex, I should say. All of that stuff is available in multiple colors and sizes and styles and everything over on our store, which is at bit.ly slash I know dino store. You can get it for yourself or a loved one or any babies that you know, since there are onesies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. If you have a baby, put them in a onesie and then have them play with the baby Funko Pop. Extra babies. Uh, yeah. Or just regular dinosaur toys. Babies like those too. That too. <laughs> but again, anything you want that's on our store. Go to bit.ly slash I know dino store. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Struthiomimus, which was a request from Marcos and Dinosaur 4602. So thanks. It was an ornithomimid dinosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous and what is now North America. And it was bipedal with long legs and it was ostrich-like. Yeah, it's probably the most ostrich-like of all the dinosaurs, I would say. Well, in fact, its name means ostrich (laughs) mimic. (laughs) It's fortunate that they didn't use that name too early and then find this one. Yeah. Like, oh, man, we should have. This is the real ostrich mimic. That's true. (laughs) Well, there's a whole group of them that are mimics. Yeah. Even though they came way before their things that they were mimicking. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But anyway, Struthiomimus is estimated to be about 14 feet, 4.3 meters long, and weigh about 330 pounds or 150 kilograms. And even though it's 14 feet long, a lot of that's a pretty narrow tail. So the bulk of its body really does look like an ostrich. Mm -hmm. It had a small elongated head and large eyes, also like an ostrich. And it had a stiff tail that it probably used for balance. It also had three toes on each foot. Struthiomimus was probably a fast runner, and that would have helped it against predators. It was estimated to run between 31 to 50 miles an hour, or 50 to 80 kilometers per hour. Yeah, and even though it could run that fast, and it was probably helpful against predators, it's still kind of weird that it ran that fast, because predators can run fast, but not that fast. So it's it seems like they might have been running for some other reason, too. Like maybe they were also a little bit predatory or something. I've seen these things proposed before. Yeah, it's hard to say. It did have toothless beaks, though, so who knows. It had long, slender arms and hands, and 
three fingers on the hand that were all about the same length with slightly curved claws, and they couldn't move much between the first finger and the second and third fingers. Struthiomimus may have been herbivorous or omnivorous, so yeah, could go after some prey, who knows. One specimen has been found with gastroliths. The hand may have been used as a hook or a clamp to bring branches to its mouth. It did have the sharp claws on the hands. So maybe it was grabbing small mammals, shoving them into its toothless beak. (laughs) It's really hard for us to know. (laughs) The type species is Struthiomimus altus. And like I mentioned before, that genus name means ostrich mimic. Altus means lofty or noble. It's a noble ostrich. (laughs) Noble ostrich mimic. Even better. (laughs) It's one of the most common ornithomimids in North America. Many struthiomimids have been found in Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, Canada. Lawrence Lamb found the fossils in 1901 and then named them Ornithomimus altus. It had longer arms and stronger fingers than Ornithomimus, and the fingers couldn't grasp food as well. The Barnum Brown then found a nearly complete skeleton in 1914 at the Red Deer Riverside in Alberta, and Henry Osborne described Struthiomimus altus in 1917 and compared it to a sloth's arm. <laughs> it said it may have helped support its wing feathers. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. It was over 100 years ago already talking about wing feathers on it. But Jurassic Park didn't get the memo. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Henry Osborne is the one who renamed Ornithomimus altus as a subgenus of Struthiomimus. Dale Russell in 1972 then made Struthiomimus a full genus and referred other specimens to it. Osborne had also renamed Ornithomimus tenius as Struthiomimus tenius in 1916, but this is now considered to be a nomum dubium. William Parks had named four more species of Struthiomimus, Struthiomimus brevitertius in 1926, Struthiomimus samuli in 1928, Struthiomimus corellii in 1933, and Struthiomimus ingens in 1933. But today they're considered to be either Dromyceomimus or Ornithomimus. Some specimens found in the lower lance formation are larger with straighter, longer claws on the hands. One was originally known as Ornithomimus sedens, but then was reclassified as Struthiomimus. There may be another species of Struthiomimus that was found in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation and therefore younger than Struthiomimus altus, but it doesn't have a name. And this one also has longer, more slender hands. Struthiomimus is one of the first theropods that was thought to be in a horizontal posture, unlike the T-Rex that was originally thought to have this dragging tail and be in the tripod posture. You can see Struthiomimus in the game Jurassic World Evolution. Although unfortunately in that, they're not feathered. So they look kind of like a plucked chicken. Or a plucked ostrich. And our fun fact of the day is going to be basically a quick history of alvarosaurids and how they almost got a different name. So alvarosaurids were found way back in the 1920s by Roy Chapman Andrews in Mongolia and his team, I should say, because there were a whole ton of them out there. But since it wasn't nearly as exciting as dinosaurs like Velociraptor and Protoceratops <laughs> that were being found in the area, it also wasn't as complete. The bones just kind of were ignored for about 70 years, being found periodically once in a while, until a much more complete Mononychus was found in the 1990s. But before Mononychus was named, in the 1970s, a pair of possible alvarosaurids were named from Romania, a place that we almost never associate with alvarosaurids. There was Bradynemi Draculae, <laughs> which, you know, is from Romania, so Dracula, they did put that in there. And then there was Heptastiornis andrewsi, which was named after Charles William Andrews, not Roy Chapman Andrews, in case you're wondering. And they named it after him because he was an important bird paleontologist. And at the time, both of them were thought to be probably owls <laughs> because they are very bird-like. And there was an argument made with Mononychus in the 90s that it probably was one of the closest related ancestors to modern birds. But since then, it's kind of ended up in a different part of the most likely family tree. But either way, for the last 10 years, this pair from Romania have generally been considered alvarosaurids, but not early enough to get the name, the group name, so they're not called Brady Nemeids. <laughs> then in 1991, Alvarosaurus was finally named, and that was the first one that was really identified as this type of dinosaur. And that's why we call them Alvarosaurids, because it took until the 90s for us to name one and figure out that it was this type of dinosaur. 
It's named after an Argentinian historian, Alvarez, not the Alvarez related to the Alvarez hypothesis, but it didn't include really great remains. It only had a tiny bit of a claw and then part of the leg and back, which was enough to identify it as this new little group of theropods that were unique. Then in 1993, just two years after Alvarosaurus was finally named, Mononychus was named with a much better preserved arm and really a better preserved specimen in general than Alvarosaurus. So it was almost called Mononychians, <laughs> which I actually think would be a much better name for the group because Mononychus means single claw. And they're the only dinosaurs we know of, really, that have this one single claw and the weird arms. So I think it would be a really good descriptive name. But unfortunately, they took too long to name it. <laughs> they had 70 years, <laughs> but we ended up with Alvarosaurus. And if they had named it earlier, they probably wouldn't have named it based on the claw anyway, because they were working for more fragmentary fossils. One last important date in the history of Alvarosaurus. In 1998, Shivuya was named, and it was the one that included the feathers on it. So now we think that likely all Alvarosaurids probably had feathers. They were Cretaceous theropods after all, and a lot of them had feathers. Plus, they were very bird-like, so it makes sense. So many bird-like dinosaurs. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our growing community on Patreon, patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.